Okay, so this is your uh, 1.1 through 1.2 lecture video. I'll try to keep these lectures pretty short. And um, you'll want to print off your notes ahead of time so you can fill them in. You can pause, rewind, fast forward anytime you'd like. All right, so we're going to review what a function is, um, how to tell if something is a function, um, talk a little bit about domain. So a function is a rule <coughs> for a relationship between an input or independent quantity and output or a dependent quantity in which each input value uniquely determines one output value. We say the output is the function of the input. The notation h of a is red, h of a. For example, if we look at this table, this is a function and it's in a table form, um, where our function is f of x and we're putting values in for it, x. So if we put negative 5 in, we get 7. If we put negative 4 in, we get 2, and so on and so forth. So what is f of negative 3? Well, when you put negative 3 in, we get 0. What is x when f of x equals 2? Well, f of x equals 2 right here, and the x value that gets us there is the negative 4. Some more examples. Find the domain and range of a relation. So the domain are all the x values, and here we can just list them because it's only four points. So they are 5, 4, 3, and 2. And the range or output values are all just negative 5. Now you don't want to list negative 5 more than once. Um, just listing it once is enough. And is the relation a function? Well, let's see if any x values are repeated. The x values are 5, 4, 3, and 2. None of them are repeated, so it must be a function. If there are repeated x values and say there was another point and the point was 5, 4. Um, we already have a 5 going to negative 5. We can't have another one going to 4. Then it wouldn't be a function. So that's what I mean. If you check and see if all the x values are different, um, then we know that we have a function. If you find two x values to be the same, then check and make sure they're going to the same place. All right, let's look at some more tables then. Which ones of these are functions? Well, the first one isn't because, see, we've got two ones and they go to different places. The second one don't have any repeated x values, so that one's good. The third one repeats a two and they're going to two different places, so not a function. The fourth one is also good. The vertical line test is a handy way to think about whether a graph defines the vertical output as a function of the horizontal input. Imagine drawing vertical lines through the graph. If any vertical line would cross the graph more than once, then the graph does not define only one vertical output for each horizontal input. So give an example of a function that passes a vertical line test and one that doesn't. So for one that passes, <coughs> it's going to be something like a problem. For one that doesn't pass, it could be something like a circle. Because if I draw a vertical line, I'm hitting two points. Your toolkit functions. It's good to know what the, I think there's eight basic functions um, that we use pretty regularly in this course. And you want to be able to identify what they are. So the first one I'm going to draw is called the identity function. And I apologize for my not so great writing on here. And that would be something um, like y equals x. And that would be graphed as just a, a line that basically divides um, 
the what's the word I'm looking for a diagonal that goes to the graph um, then we have something called a constant function like say y equals 5 and it's constant because no matter where you are yeah, my, my lines a little sloppy but no matter where I am on the x for the x values my y value is always 5 Um, the absolute value that function would look like something like y equals absolute value of x and it's sort of like a v shape with a point in the middle alright quadratic most of us are familiar with quadratic like y equals x squared And this one, it's more like a U. It has a nice smooth um, point in the middle, not a pointy one. All right, and I think the cubic function is next. Yep, cubic. And that is a function like y equals x cubed. So it's like you take a parabola and you bend one leg. That's how I think of it. And you get a cubic. The reciprocal function is y equals 1 over x. And that looks something like this. Oh, that line is kind of terrible. Let's see if I can really erase it. I can't draw things very particularly on here. There, that's much better. And there's the reciprocal squared function. So that's y equals 1 over x squared. And it's similar to the reciprocal, except both of them are in the positive um, part of the y-axis, the upper half of the, of the graph. Right, reciprocal squared, and we need the square root function. So, for example, y equals the square root of x, and that looks something like this. And last we have the cube root function. So that looks like y equals cube root of x. And that goes something like this. All right, so those are the um, functions that you want to, you know, memorize what they are. And later on, we'll take transformations of them. All right, interval notation. Here's a table that summarizes all your interval notation rules. So um, if you have an open interval, then you could have any one of these sets. And each one of these sets is represented by this interval notation. All right, and then on the, the last column, I have what the graph would look like of those. So we have some practice with that. A more compact alternative to inequality notation is interval notation. Um, we need interval notation because a lot of times we can't possibly list all of the items in the set. Um, so instead, we represent them with an interval. So the intervals about in which intervals of values are referred to by the starting and ending values. Curved parentheses are used for strictly less than and square brackets are used for less than or equal to. Likewise with strictly greater than and um, 
greater than or equal to. Since infinity is not a number, we can't include it in the interval, so we always use parentheses with infinity and negative infinity. So we want to write each one of these in interval notation. It's good to read them out loud. This is read as x is less than 3. So the biggest x can be is 3, and then the smallest it could be would be negative infinity, which I need a parenthesis for because it's infinity, and a parenthesis on the right because it's strictly less than. x is greater than or equal to 5. So the smallest x can be is 5, the largest it can be is infinity. Parentheses around infinity, but a bracket around 5 because it's greater than or equal to. Greater than 0, smallest it can be is 0, greatest infinity. Parentheses around both. When x is between two numbers, you just list them in order. And then we need a bracket for 5, parentheses for 2. Parentheses because it's strictly less than and here because it's less than or equal to. We need a bracket. Here we're going to have 0, bracket 0, comma 7, parenthesis. Again, this, the, there's an equal sign for the 0, so I need a bracket there. This stands for all real numbers, this funny looking R. And that, in interval notation, that would be negative infinity to positive infinity, with parentheses around both. All right, 1.2 is composition of functions. Um, you study this in pre-calc, but I just want to review it a little bit because it's going to help us later on with derivatives. So if you compose two functions, you want to start with the inside first. So g of 0 if I plug 0 in for, for g, then I replace the x with a 0, and 7 minus 0 squared is just 7. So this, since, f, since g is of 0 is 7, then this is really just f of 7. And f of 7 is going to be 8 times 7 minus 7, because I'm just plugging 7 in for f of x. Well, that's equal to 56 minus 7, and that's going to be 49. <coughs> All right, now the second one we're going to start again from the inside. You always start from the inside. That's f of 0. So f of 0, if I plug 0 in for f, I get 8 times 0 minus 7. That's negative 7. So really what I want is g of negative 7. Well, if I plug negative 7 in for x in the g function, I get 7 minus negative 7 squared, which is 7 minus 49, which equals negative 42. So that's how we deal with composition of functions. Now, we, get, we are so much concerned with composing functions in this class as we are with decomposing them. So that's what we're going to do in um, example 12. Um, so we have a function that is essentially an inside and an outside function, and we want to uh, identify them as such. So we usually think of f of x as the outside function. And I'll elaborate that on that more. And g of x is on the inside, the inside function. So in this case right here, we can see that the inside function, because it's inside parentheses, is x plus 7. So I'm going to say g of x is x plus 7. And then f of x is your outside function. That's what, what's happening to the x plus 7. Well, it's getting squared, so that's the x squared function. So if I were to compose these and do f of g of x, I would end up with h of x, and that's what we want. Um, so you compose it like we did on the previous example. With, with b, it's sometimes easier to get the inside function first. So what's on the inside is this x minus 2. 
And what's happening to it is we're taking the reciprocal of it. So it's the, the f of x or the outside function is your is 1 over x, so the reciprocal function. With c, if we start with the inside function, which is inside the square root, it's x squared minus 14. And the outside function is just the square root of x. With d, your inside function is going to be that x minus 6 inside the parentheses. And what's happening to it is we're taking the reciprocal and squaring it. So it's the reciprocal squared function that we talked about earlier in our library of functions. <coughs> Alright, transformations. So in your notes here I've got all the different transformations. We'll do a couple examples. Um, transformations are just good for this class because um, it's good to be able to, to think about what a graph looks like and, and transformations make it easier for us to do that. So we're starting with x squared and we're doing some vertical shifts. We want to shift it up by 3. So the new function then you're just adding 3 to it so it's x squared plus 3. So you're taking where it n its vertex normally is and you're going up to 3 and its new vertex is 0, 3. If you shift it down by 5, then you're just subtracting 5, so it's x squared minus 5. Take where its vertex normally is, shift it down 5, and then draw your graph. Horizontal shifts are left and right. Now you'll notice that the they're kind of the opposite of what you would think when you add something it actually gets shifted to the left. When you take away, you shift it to the right. So with a, x plus 2 squared, and this is actually being shifted to the right, or to the left, rather, by 2. So your vertex gets moved to the left by 2. <laughs> Undo. And then, oh, I don't know how I'm... Delete. All right, let's try that again. Oops, I need to move it. All right, here's your vertex, and then up, and up. It's a terrible graph, but I think you get the idea. When you subtract four in the inside, then you're going to move over four to the right, and then draw your parabola. Alright, so just keep in mind that the horizontal shifts are always like the opposite of what you would think. Compressing and stretching, if you stick a value out in front of the function, then it's going to stretch it vertically as long as a is greater than 1. Um, and it's going to compress it vertically if a is between 0 and 1. But if you put the a on the inside, then it's going to um, stretch the graph horizontally if A is between 0 and 1, but it's going to compress it horizontally if it's greater than 1. So for example, if we look at the function f of x equals x cubed, if we were to compress it by a factor of 5, vertically it would be 1 fifth x cubed, but horizontally it would be 5x in parentheses cubed. And then you can compare that to the stretches here. Uh, I didn't mean to say that that was their opposite. Um, and then another thing we can do with uh, transformations is reflect. And that's good to know. If you have the negative um, on the left of the function, on the outside of the function, then it's reflected about the x-axis. In other words, it's flipped down. If the negative is in the inside, then it's flipped around the y-axis. So, for example, negative x squared is just the parabola flipped upside down. And the square root of negative x, now, square root of x usually goes like this. This is square root of x. With the negative in the inside, it's being flipped over the y-axis. So we get square root of negative x here. That's how that works. 
All right, that's it for this lecture.